about a month ago, before I even considered going to the epistles of John after we concluded the John, I started to review the epistles and John's first epistle, first letter, I found myself thinking, uh, this letter sounds a whole lot like his gospel. He uses a lot of the same terms, light, darkness. And it led me to have a nagging question. And that nagging question led to a lot of prayer and a lot of thought. And we're going to talk about that nagging question. We're not going to get into the details of this tonight because the answer to this question that I kept on bothering me about the epistles um, led to tonight's study. And we're going to talk about overall a call to protect the purity of the gospel message. And so we'll go into the first epistle next week. And for the next couple of weeks, we'll go through these epistles. It's not going to be um, take as long as we did to go through the gospel to go to these through these letters. But to understand these letters, you have to understand the context in which they were written. And as the pastor has said many times, a text without a context becomes a pretext. And so we're going to look at this question, this nagging question about the epistles that John wrote. And then we're going to talk about the answer to that question and how to not only understanding what John is saying in the epistle, but more importantly, what the Holy Spirit is using this epistle to talk to the church today to talk to the disciples today about the gospel. So we're gonna go into this outline. And as I said, to understand why John wrote his epistles, we must know about the miraculous growth and changes in the early church, the new believers who came into the church, and finally, the new covenant, pure, uncontaminated gospel which the apostles preached, which resulted in the rapid growth of the early church. So, as I said before, we're going to review the context in which John wrote his epistles, which will help us understand John's message to the church and the significance of his message to the church yesterday and today. The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is, by the time the apostle John wrote his epistles to the church, all of the other apostles had died, and the church was under the leadership of a second generation of believers. The gospel message had spread to the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire who were not familiar with the Old Testament and who were influenced by the Greek culture. The apostle John wrote his epistles to call all believers to remain faithful to and protect the original gospel message. So we're going to the study that we're going to focus on is the Apostle John called upon the church to remain committed to the original gospel preached to the believers and protect the gospel message from being contaminated by the secular cultures in the Gentile world. I'm going to introduce tonight's lesson with that nagging question about why John wrote his epistles. Then we're going to talk about, from the book of Acts, the explosive growth of the church in the first century. Then we're going to go on to the pure transcendent gospel message, which was foretold in the Old Testament. And then we're going to end our discussion tonight or a lesson tonight with the contamination of the original gospel message. We're going to have some discussion questions that follow. I'm going to dispense with the implications, conclusions and applications because the study itself and the discussion questions pretty much accomplish that. We'll pick up from this lesson to go into implications, conclusions, and applications when we get into the gospel, the epistles itself. So let's get into the study itself. The Apostle John called upon the church to remain committed to the original gospel preached to the believers and to protect the gospel message from being contaminated by the secular cultures in the Gentile world. Well, let's talk about the nagging question about why John wrote his three epistles. Why, why did John write these epistles? One would think that after John finished writing the gospel, which he, which he finished before he wrote his epistles, that 
he proved that Jesus was the son of God. And he got that Jesus was sent from heaven to fulfill God's redemptive plan by bearing the sins of mankind on the cross, thereby fulfilling the requirements of the glory and holiness of God so that those who believed would receive eternal life. And after we spent 58 lessons discussing, discussing and learning about the gospel of John, what else can be said? John did a wonderful, marvelous job about proving who Jesus was and persuading people to believe in Jesus as the Son of God sent from heaven and by believing receive eternal life. Except for the revelation of events which will take place in the future, which God revealed to John while he's banished in the island of Patmos, again, I ask the question, what else needed to be said by John? So the epistles are squeezed between John writing the Gospel of John, and afterwards, John writing down what was revealed to him about the future times. And like I said before, when you compare what John said in his epistles to what he had previously written in his Gospel, you find that John often repeats and uses the same words he used in the Gospel, light, darkness, life, eternal life, and truth. This question that John wrote the epistle is an important question because the answer to the question as to why John wrote his epistles is essential to understanding the epistles themselves. Otherwise, you just tend to skip over them and say, oh, I already know this. He already told me this in the gospel. Why do I need something new? It also helps to understand the significance of these epistles, not only to the church, when John wrote these epistles, but to the church and the disciples today, a very important message. John wrote his three epistles around 80 AD after the other apostles had died and before he wrote what was revealed to him on the island of Patmos about the future events which are contained in the book of Revelation. When John wrote his three epistles, the church had changed from early church, which started at Pentecost in Jerusalem. The church, which originated in Jerusalem, started out as a church of Jewish believers, a church which was under the apostles. By the time John wrote his epistles, the God spread throughout the Roman Empire, and the majority of the believers were no longer Jews, but Gentiles, mostly Gentiles immersed in the culture of the Greeks. Because the other apostles, including the apostle Paul, who had preached the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire, had died, church was now under the lead of a second generation of believers. John did not epistles to any particular church of believers. And there's a lot of scholarship saying John doesn't identify as his audience. Who did he write these epistles to? Well, the answer is he wrote it to all the churches. He wrote it to all the individual believers. In fact, as you look closely as it speaks Speaks direct individual referring to them as mothers, young men, and children. The interpretation, meaning, and significance of John's message in his three epistles requires us to understand the historical events and changes which had taken place in the church prior to John writing these epistles. Again, he wrote these epistles toward the end of his life in about 80 to 85 AD, long after all of his apostles that were with him with Jesus had died after the church had changed ownership to the or leadership to the new generation of leaders and before he was given the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about the end times. These historical events and change are the primary focus and again it must be understood before we look at the epistles themselves and John's message. Well, let's talk about the explosive growth of the church in the first century. The Gospel of John ended with the resurrected Christ appearing to his disciples and teaching them about God's redemption. When Christ was crucified, his disciples did not understand that Jesus was the Messiah, which God promised in the Old Testament to send in order to salvation to mankind. At the end of John's Gospel, in Incidentally, at the end of all four Gospels, 
Jesus had not sent the Holy Spirit to empower his disciples to boldly proclaim the gospel of salvation. And the disciples did not fully comprehend the role that they would play in God's redemptive plan. However, when you start to read about the disciples and the growth of the church in the book of Acts, even before the disciples received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, something about the disciples had changed. The di disciples that we end the Gospels with are not the disciples that we start the book of Acts with. When the disciples were empowered by the Holy Spirit and Peter boldly proclaimed the Gospel at Pentecost, which is chapter 2 of the book of Acts, the Church of Believers was born and the number of believers grew rapidly. The remainder of the book of Acts gives us the history of the early church born in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and expanded into the Gentile world throughout the world the Roman Empire. The growth and expansion of the church in the first century, as I mentioned before, was explosive, miraculous, and perhaps unparalleled and not matched in later centuries. If you want to talk something like spreading something spreading like wildfire, from the day of Pentecost on, this first century church grew so rapidly that it didn't even feel its own growing pains, although it dealt with a lot of growing pains. In chat, let's just go through this real quickly to impress upon you how quickly the early church exploded and expanded. In chapter one, on the day of Pentecost, 120 believers, including the disciples who had gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem, were waiting for Jesus to send the promised Holy Spirit, 120 people. In chapter two, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter boldly, boldly proclaimed the gospel to the crowd that had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, and 3,000 repented and believed, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Following Pentecost, Luke reports that the new believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Luke concludes chapter 2 of the book of Acts reporting that they, the new believers, broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. In chapter 4, Luke reports that the church continued to grow, saying that in Acts 4.4, 4, many who heard the message believed and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The new church included women and children. Instead of trying to count the total number of new believers, the early leaders of the church resorted to counting only the men. They were growing so rapidly, they had to figure out an easier way to count the new believers. 5,000 new believers of men translated to 10 to 20,000 believers that just grew very quickly in the early church. In chapter 6, Luke reports that the number of disciples continued to increase, causing the apostles to choose seven men from among the new believers to take over the responsibility to minister to all the new believers. Luke then reported in Acts verse 7, chapter 6, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Again, Luke is emphasizing this rapid expansion of the church. After the conversion of Paul, Luke continued his narrative about the growth of the church of believers throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. In chapter 9, Luke writes, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria in a time of peace. It was and encouraged by the it grew in numbers being in fear of the Lord. Again, this word is catching on like wildfire, describing how those who Jerusalem because of the persecution of sin. And these people traveled, went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. Luke reported that believers from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and shared the gospel with the Gentiles, the Greeks. Luke then wrote in Acts chapter 11, verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. When the news about the conversion of the Gentiles in Antioch reached the church in Jerusalem, the church, uh, primarily a Jewish church in Jerusalem, sent Barnabas to encourage the new believers. Luke reported in Acts 11, verses 23 and 24, when he, Barnabas, arrived at Antioch, 
and saw all the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and, and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now, after encouraging the new believers in Antioch, Barnabas went to Tarsus to find Saul, who went back to Antioch with Barnabas, where for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great number of people. Luke reported, Acts 11, verse 26, disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What we're seeing is what started in Jerusalem as a Jewish church started to spread all around Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and in Syria, where Antioch is located, it expanded so rapidly that now the Gentiles that were part of that church in Antioch were called for the first time Christians. Luke then described how through the three missionary journeys of Paul, the church expanded throughout the Roman Empire, increasing the number of Gentiles who became believers to the point that the number of Gentile believers vastly exceeded the number of Jewish believers. And as we were introduced to the book of Romans, when Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, he was writing to a church of mixed Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And most scholars say that when he wrote that letter to the book of Romans, well, the, the church in Rome was primarily a Gentile church. Most scholars, believers, and biblical historians ascribe the rapid growth of the early church to the resurrection of Jesus and to the empowerment given to the disciples by filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, that would be very simple to say. They saw the risen Christ. They preached the risen Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit helped the disciples uh, build the church. But that's not the whole story. There are two other things that need to be considered in revealing uh, how and why this early church expanded so explosively. The two, the two things are um, the disciples' new understanding of the Old Testament and their preaching of the gospel free from the influence and contamination of the different cultures where the gospel was being preached. Before the disciples received the Holy Spirit, which empowered them to boldly and courageously proclaim the gospel, Jesus taught the disciples so that they would fully understand how the Old Testament scriptures revealed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, who God promised to the Old Testament prophets to send into the world to fulfill his redemptive plan. Between the end of the gospels and the beginning of the book of Acts, the mindset set of the disciples had been changed because Jesus spent his time during that 40 days he is with them, not all 40 days, but the time he spent with them during that 40-day period, revealing to them and teaching them how he, as the Son of God sent from heaven, fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of God's redemptive plan. So, we uh, we studied this already, but in the Gospel of Luke, Luke describes how Jesus taught the two disciples who left Jerusalem and were traveling on the road to Emmaus about how the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled by Christ as the promised Messiah. In Luke 24, verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Before this, the disciples didn't understand the Old Testament scriptures. They didn't understand that they pointed towards Jesus. Jesus explained to two disciples later that evening when the two uh, disciples that heard G Jesus' message immediately returned to Jerusalem and joined the other disciples. They were hiding at that time. That evening, Jesus appeared to those disciples except Thomas and he appeared and explained to them how he had fulfilled Old Testament prophecy to him as a Messiah. And so Luke goes on to say, starting with verse 44 in, in chapter 24, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Old Testament. Then he opened them so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
You are the witnesses of these things. What changed is that the disciples' eyes were open. They understood the Old Testament scriptures. They understood that the Old Testament scriptures pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. And they also understood that God revealed in the Old Testament, oh, by the way, you're Jesus' disciples. The next phase of God's redemptive plan is you're going to go throughout the world and witness what you know. You're going to witness the risen Christ. You're going to witness the Old Testament scriptures being fulfilled. You're going to witness salvation by the grace and mercy of God. And you're going you're gonna to build a church based upon the, the role that God previewed in the Old Testament that you would fulfill in the next phase, phase of God's redemptive plan. So in the disciples, before the Holy Spirit indwelt in them through the teaching of Christ, not only understood now for the first time the Old Testament scriptures and how they were pointed to Jesus and how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, but they also realized God had provided for them to do the next phase of redemptive salvation. They were going to spread the gospel. In the book of Acts, Luke demonstrated how the disciples were transformed by Jesus' explaining to them the Old Testament scriptures. Now think about the Old Testament or the, the four gospels. How many times in the four gospels did we say that was there a notation that but the di disciples did not understand the di disciples did not know um the, if you read through the four gospels that's repeated re frequently um how many times do you see in the four gospels the disciples quoting old testament scriptures we saw jesus quoting old testament scriptures and it's being written down in the gospels but we don't see any of the gospels coming, uh, the uh, apostles coming forward and saying, well, in Joel, it said this about Jesus. That didn't happen in the four gospels. But what happens in the book of Acts? It starts out with Luke describes how Peter, and by implication and example, the other disciples not only knew and understood the Old Testament scriptures, but relied upon and frequently quoted the Old Testament scriptures which pointed to Jesus as a promised Messiah. In fact, the book of Acts starts with Peter specifically referring to the Old Testament scriptures, quoting from the book, the Psalms of David to choose a replacement for Judas who betrayed Jesus. Peter all of a sudden goes back to the Psalms of David and says, here are the Psalms of David that pointed that there would be an opening a gap because of Judas's betrayal, and we need to find a replacement for him. And so they selected two people, they cast lots and chose uh, a, a replacement uh, for Judas, citing and rely upon the Old scripture, Old Testament scriptures. In his sermons and speeches, Peter at Pentecost and later in his public speeches at the temple frequently quoted Old Testament scriptures, which pointed to Jesus as a promised Messiah. Even Stephen, with a clarity, recited Old Testament scriptures which pointed to Jesus as a Messiah and as a person sent by God to carry forward God's final redeem. Peter and the other disciples quoted Old Testament scriptures from the prophet Joel, from the Psalms, and from other Old Testament prophetic re revelations. Without going into a lot of detail, when you look at the book of Acts, modern translations, when they disciples quoted Old Testament scriptures, they're identified in two different ways. One, they're either indented, set apart from Luke's text in the book of Acts, or they're, they're in a completely different font. So what you see, if you just go through the book of Acts, you're gonna see quote after quote after quote from the Old Testament by the disciples. And so Jesus and his teaching and opening the eyes of disciples opened their eyes to how Jesus was the promised Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies. So armed with the resurrection of Christ, armed with their knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament scriptures, 
And then given the power of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were on fire. The apostles were out there preaching the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy that Jesus was promised and was the Messiah and how he is resurrected and there are witnesses to the resurrection. And then you get to Paul, who as a rabbi knew the Old Testament. He had the more arduous thing because the disciples in Jerusalem were reviewing the Old Testament to other Jews who knew the Old Testament. Opening and the Spirit of God was opening their eyes saying, oh, is that what the Old Testament meant? Oh, it does point to Jesus. And Jesus is resurrected and we crucified him. You could see to the the disciples in Jerusalem speaking to Jews, much easier task. But Paul was speaking to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles had no idea what the Old Testament was. Something Jewish. That's something over in Jerusalem. So Paul not only preached the gospel, but he had to bring in and explain some of the Old Testament scriptures to the Gentiles so that they would understand that Jesus just didn't appear suddenly, but he was part of God's redemptive plan for the salvation of all mankind. And so you see Paul in what he did to spread the gospel, trying to pull out of the Old Testament what he needed to pull out in order to explain that Jesus wasn't just to come lately, but he was part of a massive plan of God's plan for redemption and salvation. So not only did Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures advance the gospel, but the disciples' new understanding of how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures enabled them to preach the gospel. Well, let's talk about the gospel that they preached. Even what the disciples said to build the church after the resurrection and ascension of Christ was foretold in the Old Testament. The pure transcendent gospel message was foretold in the book of Ezekiel. So in addition to the disciples, Jesus this is full of the Old Testament scriptures, enabled them to preach the gospel of salvation. The gospel which they preached was a message which the Old Testament prophets promised would be preached by the disciples. In the book of Ezekiel, after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, foretold the new covenant gospel, which would be preached as the next phase to implement the plan of God's plan of redemption. Let's look at chapter 36 of the book, book of Ezekiel. God explained to Ezekiel the new covenant gospel, which the disciples preached and which would carry forward God's plan of redemption. Starting in chapter 36, verse 16, the scriptures say, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. When the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanliness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct in their actions. When they, and whenever, wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people. And yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you and the nations where have you gone. Is holy. He chose Israel to be a witness to holiness, to be a holy nation, to be a witness to the world. Israel profaned God's holy name. And this isn't the first time we are introduced to the concept that the reason that God foretold of the new covenant gospel was because he was going to protect his holy name, which was defamed. Remember back in the end of the book of Exodus, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and the law from the Lord, and the Jewish people were down in the valley making a golden calf. And God tells Moses, 
you're not going to like what's going on down in the valley. And God said, God was stirred up with anger. And he told Moses, I'm going to destroy all these people. My, my anger, my holiness is defiled by what they're doing. And I'm going to start over with you, Moses. What was Moses' response? Oh, God, why would you do that? That would only prove that you brought the people out of Israel, but you didn't have the power to bring them to the land that you promised. Your holiness, your word is going to be compromised by destroying your people and starting over with me. Moses was telling God in supplication, protecting God's holy name. This is a theme that sometimes the Christians don't understand today. They think that somehow we're the reason that God chose to save us. Well, one of the main reasons God chose, and that's in the scriptures, is God was, when he created man, man was to be created to glorify and to witness a holy God. When man sinned, God's name, his holiness was profaned, blasphemed. God instituted immediately his plan of redemption to show his holiness and to show that his word and his creation will be accomplished through his plan of salvation. So going on, as I said, starting repeating what I said, therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you've gone. I will show you the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will become clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will save you from all your uncleanliness. How many times in those scriptures do we hear God saying, I, I will, I will. The people have nothing to do with it. It's God that is going to implement his plan of salvation. Now, Ezekiel, at first glance, and literally is speaking about the nation of Israel. But Behind it, he's also speaking about his church, about bringing the spirit and building his church, which will be composed of the Gentiles that are and, and, uh, and those believers during the church age, and then followed by the tribulation and then bringing Israel back into the fold. Let's talk about, about these verses summarizing the pure gospel of God's redemptive plan which the disciples preached and upon which God's church was founded. The following principles of the New Testament gospel are extracted from these verses in Ezekiel. Israel, and by extension, all mankind was and is corrupted by sin, and their corruption profaned and blasphemed God's holy name. Second, God protects his holy name by punishing Israel and all mankind and all sinners. God demonstrated his holiness by the new covenant gospel through which he cleanses men from all sin and changes man's heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Let me give you an example of what's being talked about there. If I had in front of my office a stone statue and I went up and I tickled its feet, the statue wouldn't move. If I punched the statue, I would be feeling pain, but the statue would feel nothing. Mankind without God is a heart of stone. But if you make it a heart of flesh, then it's living and it reacts. And when you tickle the toes, it giggles. And when you punch it, 
it, it wants to re respond. God is saying, I'm going to take the heart of stone of disbelief, blasphemy, uncleanliness, and sin, and I'm going to make it a heart of flesh. And then what he's going to do is he's going to not only cleanse the person from his sin, but he's going to change the man's heart from a heart of stone to flesh, which is a heart that he will fill with the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, God transforms sinful man by making him a new creature who will obey God's commandments and will glorify God. God gathers together all those he calls and transforms them by changing their hearts and filling them with this Holy Spirit. The ones who are called and believe will be taken out of the nations of the world and gathered together and given a new land of salvation. When we talk about mankind in his state of a hardened heart, a heart of stone, in his state of sin, he's dead. And he will receive God's judgment and wrath. It takes God to change that man from a sinner to a person that God will work with until his work is accomplished in that sinner's life. It makes me think of the Old Testament where God said through Malachi, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Well, what does that really mean when it comes to salvation? Esau was blessed by, by God. He went through life. He had large cattle, wealth. He had a large family. He had descendants. He prospered. Jacob also prospered. But what was the difference? One of them belonged to God. The other one didn't. And we know Jacob belonged to God because throughout Jacob's life, all God did is discipline him, change him from the lying, deceitful person he was to the person he became before he died. When God loves you, he disciplines you. He uses his spirit that's within you to change you and transform you into a new creation, the new creature that you became when you were saved. My mom, another story. You know, my mom said we didn't have very much money. So at school start, they'd buy us new clothes. My mom said, when you go to school, don't tarry after school and play with your friends and get your dirty, clothes dirty. Come home and change them because these are the clothes that are going to last for the whole year. Well, being a rebellious young kid, I stayed after school and I stayed with Mike and Steve and we wrestled and everything. And by the time I got home, I was going on the way home. I noticed my clothes were filthy and I knew I was in trouble. So I told my friends to join me. And when I got home, I could see my mother and she wasn't happy. And I said, mom, we all wrestled and got our clothes dirty. And she said, those two are not my children. You are my child and you've disobeyed me. That's God. God doesn't di discipline those that he doesn't recognize. He disciplines those that are his children. And so what we have here is Ezekiel talking about the transformation that God causes for his own glory that takes a person and changes them from a sinful person into a person that God will spend eternity with in his holiness. So the gospel preached by the disciples at Pentecost and which should be preached throughout the age of the church was and should remain a gospel of God's redemptive plan where God in his sovereignty chooses to give the gift of salvation to sinners in order to demonstrate his power, mercy, and holiness. The New Testament gospel reveals the truth that God sent Jesus and accepted Jesus' death and sacrifice and atonement for the sins of men so that each believer will be cleansed and transformed by the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Each believer receives salvation from God and from God only by acknowledging his sin 
and turning God to God to forgive his sins and release them from the penalty, punishment, and wrath of God. Once God called into salvation and transformed by God into a new creature, each believer will continue to be cleansed with a new heart of flesh, to be sanctified and molded to obey and glorify God by the power of the Holy Spirit sent into his heart. For his own glory, God is the one who provides the means of salvation from his wrath, judgment, and punishment. I'm going to bring an illustration of this point one more way. Spurgeon illustrated the work of salvation which transforms a believer and changes a believer's heart by referring to a man in his sin as being a pig. Spurgeon wrote, in his sinful nature, man is like a pig. If a pig is given the opportunity, opportunity to choose from a plate of the most splendid dish of food and a bucket of garbage, a pig will always choose to eat from the bucket of garbage. That's what pigs do. Where, where God in his sovereignty and power miraculously changed the pig into a man, the man would realize that he has been sustaining his life by eating from a bucket of garbage. He would regret what he has been doing and who desire to eat the fresh and splendid dish offered by God. If as a pig transformed by God into a man were to return to his former nature and try to sustain himself by eating the garbage in the bucket, knowing that he was changed into a man, he had turned away in disgust and seek cleansing from the Lord. We are reprobates without the salvation from the Lord. We are monsters, we are sinful people, and we're condemned by God's wrath. God's salvation, his redemptive plan, is to transform us into people that will become holy and live eternally with God. The power of God to change the heart of a sinful man, to cleanse him from his sin and change him into a new creature, in my mind, is even greater than the power of creating the whole world out of nothing. I think that the miracle of changing a sinful man into a saint is a power of God. This new covenant gospel of salvation was preached without regard to any cultures which existed after the resurrection of Christ. It was a gospel which spoke to the individual about that individual's sin, God's punishment for sin, and God's power through the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to cleanse and transform the believer into a new creation with a heart oriented toward obeying and identifying and, and glorifying God. In chapter two of the book of Acts and throughout the first the rest of the book, where Luke talked about the explosive growth of the church, the gospel preached by the disciples was not contaminated by any cultures of those who were called to believe the message. At Pentecost, Luke describes all the nationalities who were present to hear Peter's message of salvation. The message was not contaminated by the cultures of those who were present. At Pentecost, Luke reported that the members of the crowd asked how the disciples were able to speak to them in their native language. In chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, Luke reports, Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians. Um, Elamites, uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pygra and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Abrams. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Not one, <laughs> despite all these different nations that were present during the Pentecost miraculous salvation of 3,000, did the disciples ever make a message to convert the gospel or teach them the gospel using the, their own culture? So let's, now we get with that background, a whole long part to get to this point. By the time that John wrote his gospel and the church had changed to new leadership and spread among the Gentiles, there began to be contamination of the gospel and the message was being diluted by this contamination as the church expanded and reached the gentiles throughout the roman empire the culture of the greeks began to contaminate the gospel message 
even though the first century world was ruled by Rome, the culture <clears throat> was essentially a Greek culture. Most of the new believers in the church were immersed in the Greek culture, which valued human knowledge and wisdom, and which believed in a duality which distinguished between the spirit from the and the flesh. They really said that you could be two people in one, and the spirit can be immersed in wisdom and knowledge and achieve what the Greeks understood to be salvation and eternal life. And the flesh can continue on being the flesh because the flesh by its very nature is corrupt. So what we had is a large number of these Gentiles immersed in the Greek culture, beginning to believe, taking on the Greek culture, that they could be saved in the spirit by acquiring wisdom and they can still continue in their fleshly sexual desires and lust and sinful nature. And so this was the really essence of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is translated as wisdom. It, the, that how the culture of Greece got immersed into the gospel. And so now believers in the church were being confused. They're saying, well, we grew up understanding that wisdom and the spirit led to salvation and that our flesh, our flesh was corrupt and we can't do anything about that. And so they started to be in the church with that same belief. And so this got Gnosticism, which infiltrated and contaminated the new covenant gospel originally preached by the disciples, not only added a work to salvation, and as a work, we know that works do not lead to salvation. But according to the Gnostics, a believer who acquired wisdom leading to salvation did not have to be concerned about sin and the works of the flesh. The Gnostics argued that a believer could continue to engage in sinful practices without losing his salvation. The Greek culture began to contaminate the gospel message. Like a small amount of ink, when dropped into to a glass of water ruins a glass and it ruins the entire glass of water so it can't be consumed. The Greek culture was a contaminating the gospel message originally preached by the apostles. So now we get to the point. John wrote his epistles to turn the Gentile believers back to the original gospel message they received and to rebuke believers for allowing the gospel of salvation to be contaminated by the culture of the Greeks. Now I see, when we go through these epistles, keep in mind this lesson. John is saying in his epistles, I recognize that the church has changed. I recognize the church has grown into the Gentile world. I know that the Gentile world has its own philosophy, its own wisdom, and things like this. But lo don't let that get into the gospel. Don't let the cu culture contaminate the true message that salvation comes from God through the sacrifice of Jesus on the Christ cross and without the sacrifice of Jesus and believing that he's the son of God that came for salvation, you're going to be condemned and you are going to hell and you're not going to receive God's salvation. And so then John goes on in the epistles and starts to talk about how you cannot be in the darkness and still have the light. And he talks about how you cannot, if you say that you're not a sinner, like the Gnostics did, because all oh, the sin is the flesh, but we're saved by the wisdom. And so John is specifically addressing how the influence of the Greek culture started to contaminate the gospel message. So now we're going to take into the account the discussion questions, which are going to expand and apply what we have learned in tonight's lesson to the church today.